Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dan Rizzuto of Nia Therapeutics, and he's really, really cool. So I highly recommend listening to this episode. So I met him a few weeks ago at the Neurotech Leaders Forum conference in San Francisco, and he has a really cool project, which is basically Nia Therapeutics does neurostimulation to treat memory impairment. Yeah, you heard that right. Actually, with having this implant in your brain, you could remember better. That's nuts, isn't it? So basically people with traumatic brain injuries, TBIs, they're able to come back to a normal level. 25% of them are able to come back to a normal level. So really, really kind of futuristic stuff. And I'm already thinking like, oh, this will be good for studying or, you know, learning a language or learning a new skill or something like that. But, you know, it's a bit invasive for that. But yeah, it's really, really cool stuff. So hope you guys enjoy. Dan Rizzuto, pleasure to have you on the show. We met at the Neurotech Leaders Forum in San Francisco, put on by Neurotech Reports. Really, really cool stuff. Honestly, what you're doing is amazing. It's memory prosthetics, and it's not like too futuristic. And we've, we've talked to a lot of people about this, but or like a lot of people have mentioned this, but you're the first person to come on the show to actually talk about this. So Dan, pleasure to have you on the show. And do you want to explain what you're doing a little bit? Sure. So Nia Therapeutics spun out from the University of Pennsylvania back in January of this year to develop active implantable devices for restoring memory to patients with memory disorders such as traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease. This is technology that I've been developing at the University of Pennsylvania, along with my partner, Mike Kahana, for the past four years as part of the Restoring Active Memory Project, which was funded by DARPA. And of course, DARPA is a military R&D agency. They are very interested in developing new treatments for patients with traumatic brain injury. So that was the overarching goal of the project. And this is based on a really a, a couple of decades of research that really understands at a deep level the neurophysiological signals that underlie human memory. So right now, at this point in time, we have a really good understanding of the brain signals that relate to human memory. And this project, the RAM Restoring Active Memory Project allowed us to develop stimulation paradigms that could actually modulate and improve human memory. So over the past four years at the University of Pennsylvania, along with nine other clinical centers around the country, that's what we did. We developed these stimulation protocols that are able to improve human memory performance. Wow, that's incredible. I have to, first of all, commend you on the name. That's pretty clever, like RAM, like computer RAM. But what does that mean? Doing, uh, DARPA is big on acronyms. So restoring active memory was the project that they developed in order to move this technology forward. I wonder how you get that job to like name these projects and have them be clever. (laughs) Good question. Yes, I'm sure there's probably one dedicated person at DARPA because they have so many projects and so many acronyms and they're all pretty clever. So So what does this mean, restoring uh, human memory? So like your active memory will be better or can you recall things from the past that you wouldn't have been able to recall or how exactly does this work? Sure. So first, what we understand about the human memory system and is that there are clear biomarkers, as I mentioned earlier, that underlie human memory. And these biomarkers, so for instance, when somebody remembers something well, there is a increase in high frequency activity at select brain areas, such as the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And there's a corresponding decrease in low frequency in the power at low frequencies in these same areas. So there's essentially a tilt in the power spectrum, an increase 
in high frequencies. And when I'm talking about high frequencies, I'm talking about the electrocorticogram. That's the signal of interest that our technology is based on. This is not single unit recordings like some technologies that are single cells in the brain. We're recording from populations of neurons in the brain, probably tens of thousands of neurons firing synchronously in one particular brain area. And these signals, they resemble the EEG, but they're much more fine scaled and much more precise than the EEG that's recorded outside of the skull and outside of the scalp. These intracranial signals are very fine scaled. They have very fine temporal and spatial dynamics. And what you find when you look at these signals during memory performance is this tilt in the power spectrum that corresponds to increased memory performance. That is when somebody remembers information, when you present a list, say you present a a list of 12 words to a subject with implanted electrodes in their brain, and they remember six of those words, and they don't remember the other six of the words, just for a simple example. If you look at the brain activity for those six words that they remembered, What you find is there's this increase in high frequency activity at those sites that I mentioned and a decrease in low frequency activity. And that actually predicts which items the subject is going to remember. So this is really an incredible foundation of our technology, which is understanding what good memory looks like in each patient, in each subject in our studies. And there are these signals that predict this. And what's interesting, and this was understood before the Restoring Active Memory Project got underway, but it really provided the whole foundation for the project. What's interesting is if you stimulate at just the right time, at just the right location in the brain, and we can go into those later, what you find is you can make the brain look more like it does in a good memory state. That is, you can increase this high frequency activity and decrease these low frequency activities in global throughout the brain, causing an increase in memory performance. So just by looking at the brain to recap, we can tell if somebody's in a good memory state or a bad memory state just by looking at their brain activity. And when you stimulate at the right time in the right place, you can move them out of a bad memory state into a good memory state. You can think of this technology as keeping the patient in the zone. And so this is just at recall then, right? Like this is not necessarily at the learning stage, right? So you could have learned something a while ago and you're just fuzzy on it and this makes you unfuzzy, right? Actually, all of the work that we've done to date is stimulating during the encoding phase. We are making the brain more efficient at encoding new information. So that's what we've demonstrated so far. And we've demonstrated this in three different publications that I'm happy to send you. I don't know if the podcast has show notes, but it might be helpful for your listeners to see some of those references. Yeah, we can put those papers in the show notes, actually. That's a really good idea. Great. Happy to do that. So what we've done is we've stimulated during the encoding process (laughs) and shown that that can improve recall at a later date. What's interesting about these biomarkers of memory, if you look at some of these foundational papers, we've published on this very recently as well, the biomarkers of good encoding in the brain look very similar to the biomarkers of good retrieval. So we think that even though so far all we've demonstrated is that stimulation increases the efficiency of encoding. That is, it helps encode new memories better. We also think that stimulation will help retrieve memories as well because the biomarkers are so similar. You can think of these biomarkers that we've identified as being representative of a good cognitive state. It tells you when the brain is receptive to memory, processing memory, both encoding and retrieval. Wow. That's incredible. So you could almost, you know, I'm a student, right? So this is the first thing I'm thinking of is, you know, how how do I use this for my own studies? So you could actually tell if somebody is going to learn something well then, right? That's right. These biomarkers predict 
if somebody is in a good memory state or a bad memory state. And it's not a perfect prediction, but it's pretty good, right? You have really good discriminability in, between these brain states. The features of brain activity that we're picking up on are fairly strong and discriminable from one another. Wow. That's excellent. And now you've actually spun out a company from this. What do you hope to do with this and who would buy this? Right. So we are developing active implantable devices. So these are only for patients with significant impairments in memory performance. Where our initial target clinical indication is patients with traumatic brain injury. And this is a huge global burden. It's estimated that there's 50 to 60 million traumatic brain injuries that occur each year worldwide. There are currently in the United States over 5 million Americans that are living with a disability due to a traumatic brain injury. And of those, we estimate that there's about 1.6 million Americans that are living with a significant memory impairment due to a traumatic brain injury that could be eligible for a medical device to treat their memory impairment. And if you talk to these patients about their symptoms that they experience, you know, there's a variety of symptoms for of traumatic brain injury. Deficits in learning, memory, and attention are really the core symptoms, but you can also have physical disability after a brain injury and even behavioral and, and mood disorders. But really cognitive learning, memory, and attention are the core deficits that occur after TBI. And if you talk to these patients, what you'll find is it's often very socially awkward. It's difficult for them to hold conversations. It's difficult for them to follow the plot of a conversation and to remember names. And so they become socially isolated because they become self-conscious of their disability. If they were lucky enough to return to work, they find that they're often not able to work at the same level of productivity that they were earlier. And if they're in school, they find that they're not able to study and learn as effectively as they used to. So, and many of these patients get a diagnosis of cognitive disability after their injury. And these can be assessed by various neuropsychological scales, like the California Verbal Learning Test or the Wexler Memory Scale. And so what we estimate is that we've shown in our publications that there's about a 18% increase in recall when words are accompanied by stimulation, that we use word list learning tasks in our studies to show the efficacy of our therapeutic approach. And these are randomized, controlled, and blinded studies. So very rigorous demonstration of improvements in human memory that can happen with our therapy. And we found that on average, subjects get about an 18% boost in memory performance. And we estimate that this would move 25% of patients with traumatic brain injury out of the cognitive disabled category into the non-disabled category. So to sum up, this is for impaired individuals who have some sort of cognitive impairment, either memory impairment or learning impairment. And we estimate that it would actually change them from a disabled status to a non-disabled status. That's wow. a proposition for somebody who may be struggling in their daily life due to a cognitive impairment. Yeah, for sure. That really is interesting. But I'm curious, I mean, 18% doesn't sound like too much. What's maybe the variance in the normal population and how much less is it mentally you know, disabled versus non-mentally disabled? Good question. It's hard to know at the outset. Nobody has ever developed an a intervention that increased memory performance before, right? So even those drugs for Alzheimer's disease, the so-called cholinesterase inhibitors, they don't actually improve memory. All they do is prevent the further impairment or degradation of memory. So it's not really known how much of a memory boost you need in order to see functional improvements in your daily life. But you can think of memory very much like you do interest in a bank account, a bank account that gives you 18% more interest over time. 
will be significantly greater than a bank account that gives you 18% less interest, right? So memory is cumulative. The more you can remember, the faster you can learn. So even though 18% may seem like a small amount, it compounds your learning rate. And so we think that this will have significant impacts on the quality of life for patients with memory disability. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Okay, again, you know, as a, from a student's point of view, I'm just thinking about off-label uses and like, how do I study or learn a language faster, or learn a skill faster? How would that be useful in this case? Yeah, so right now, because it does require a surgical intervention, it's very similar. This technology is very similar to deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease or essential tremor, which is a well-studied and understood and clinically validated therapy that's been around for about 20 years. And we're just applying this in a slightly new way to cognitive disorders like memory impairment. And right now, this technology just like DBS for Parkinson's disease, does require a implanted device, right? It's a brain stimulator. And so due to the risks of deep brain stimulation surgery, it's really only appropriate for patients with a significant impairment. Those are the patients who can accept the risk and gain the benefits from this type of technology. But down the road, You can think of this type of technology as the surgical risks become less and less over time. And we've seen this over the past 10 years in neurosurgery already with the increase in surgical planning tools and surgical techniques. The risks of neurosurgery have come down drastically over the past 10 years. And I expect that they will continue to do so. And as those risks come down, And as the approach becomes less and less invasive, you can imagine the pool of subjects that would be eligible for this type of technology would increase. And I can imagine a day, for instance, when the risks of neurosurgical implantation of this device approach that of rhinoplasty, when the risks of neurosurgery are similar to that of getting a nose job, you can imagine that this would open up the pool of subjects to healthy aging, for instance. And because we know that memory performance degrades over the lifespan, and we believe that this treatment is potentially able to treat many different types of memory impairment, including injuries, progressive diseases like Alzheimer's disease, and even memory impairment and mild, what's known as mild cognitive impairment that happens normally over the age span. Interesting. So does this actually affect everybody equally? I mean, like uh, kids, young people and adults, or does this something like bring you back to normal or what kind of improvements are seen amongst groups? An 18% improvement in memory will make a 60-year-old's memory performance look like a 40-year-old's memory performance. That's the level of or a way of gauging the memory performance increases that we're talking about. And we also think that 18% is really a just the beginning for this type of intervention. Because we've had to test this approach and develop this approach in neurosurgical patients who were undergoing clinical care for other reasons, not necessarily related to memory impairment, We had our one hand tied behind our back, so to speak, when we were developing this therapy. We couldn't control the placement of the electrodes. We only had two weeks to work with each patient while they were in the hospital. So we think as we move to a clinical trial, we're going to have much greater control over the placement of the electrodes. We'll have much more time, about a year, to work with each patient in the clinical study. So We think that there's an opportunity to increase the efficacy of the therapy beyond what we've shown already in our clinical studies. And we've seen patients in our studies so far who have had 30 or 40 percent increases in their memory performance with stimulation. So we think that's what's possible with this technology right now. 
Wow, that's incredible. So I've actually experimented a little bit with uh, nootropics like modafinil and basically like these alertness drugs that kind of, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Limitless, you know, where, yeah. where the guy takes the drug and, and then he like gets a thousand IQ. And that's kind of what this is modeled off of. And I really enjoyed it. But at the same time, what I came away from that and is kind of like, there's no such thing as a free lunch in biology. So if you add to one side, you have to take away from the other side. Do you know if your technology does something like this as well? Like if you stimulate for a long time? Does it tire out the brain and then and then you can't learn later on? Or what are some maybe downside effects from this? Good question. So far, we haven't observed any side effects of our stimulation. And we've tested this in over 200 subjects so far. But this will need to be much more tightly controlled and studied in our first clinical trial, which is anticipated in about three years from now. Okay. Very cool. I'm very curious about this process. You know, like, again, we, we met at Neurotech Leaders Forum, which is kind of more of an entrepreneurial conference. And so can you kind of outline the steps of you were doing this research, you had this DARPA funding, and then you're like, this is really cool. And we want to make a business out of this. So what did that look like? How have you been progressing through this? Yeah, it's been a really exciting process. And starting a company, a neurotechnology company specifically has been a dream of mine for many years. And, you know, I've had a little bit of a circuitous career in that I, you know, I got my PhD in neuroscience and human memory and it really at a basic research type of projects at that time went on to do postdoctoral work in brain machine interfaces and then ran clinical trials and various neuroscience indications for many years before coming back to academia and developing this technology with my business partner, Penn. So it's been really fascinating to develop this technology at the University of Pennsylvania. We submitted two different patents that are now progressing through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So that was really interesting to develop those patents for that describe our strategies for stimulating the brain to improve cognitive performance. And then starting a business. I mean, you need to define that there's an actual patient market that is willing and able to pay for the therapy and the product that you're developing. So we've done some assessment of the traumatic brain injury market, the Alzheimer's market. Those are the two patient markets that we think are potentially treatable using our technology. And then we've been on a real and extended fundraising effort over the past six months or seven months. And I'm very excited to tell you, and you're probably the, the first one I've publicly told about this, that we've just closed our first financing of over a million dollars to develop this technology. This is just the first step. We found some investors who are very excited about the NIA technology and are excited to help us take it to the next step. In the next stage, we are planning to design our platform with our engineering partner and then meet with the FDA in order to clarify the regulatory path and the steps, exact clinical steps that are needed to take this thing through to commercial approval and to marketing. So it's been an, a really interesting process and very exciting and a little bit of a roller coaster, but it's really been a lot of fun. So I'm excited to, now that we've closed this funding, to take the next steps and move this concept closer to reality. That really is exciting news. Congratulations. That must feel really, really good. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. So does it complicate anything that it was originally a DARPA project or is it just like any other university spinoff? It's like any other university spinoff. When the government funds this type of work, either through DARPA or the NIH, they do not lay claim to the intellectual property that's generated it. It's really all of that resides at the university. So right now, NIA is in the process of licensing that technology from the University of Pennsylvania. That process should be completed soon. And yeah, then we go from there. Wow, that's really cool. So what are the next steps? I mean, what do you hope to do with this million dollars? And actually, a million dollars for clinical trials, that does not sound like that's going to be enough. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. So like I said, it's the pathway to commercialization for a class three medical device is pretty extensive. And 
this funding right now, it will just get us to the next step of designing the platform and then meeting with the FDA. Once we've designed the platform and designed the clinical trial that we're planning on carrying out with patients with traumatic brain injury, we'll meet with the FDA to get their feedback on our device and our clinical plans. That's really the key de-risking event. Investors are all about risk, right? And the main risk that I've been able to identify from potential investors is the regulatory risk, the risk of getting through the clinical trials process. So we're going to be meeting with the FDA to identify exactly what the parameters are for us to move into that first clinical trial. Yeah, exactly. You can work with them. Actually, that is a little known fact. And this is something that we learned at the conference too, was it is a little known fact that they actually do work with you. They do want to see you succeed. And they're not just like motionless bureaucracy. We've met with the FDA already. We had really outstanding conversation with them. I think they're excited about the technology and really want to work with us to develop it and make it and help us move it through the clinical pathway. So I'm very excited about that conversation. Wow. That's really incredible stuff. I mean, I hope to follow you know, these kind of footsteps one day and do something similar, but it would be at least half a decade out, maybe a decade out, something like this. But you said this was a four-year project, right? And, and you had come from somewhere else before that. You were, you were doing neuroscience before and then kind of secured this path. How long has this been in the works, I guess? So before moving to Philadelphia, I was out in Seattle and worked at a, a couple of different places out in Seattle from North Star Neuroscience that was developing brain stimulators for major depression to the Swedish Neuroscience Institute, where I was running a clinical research program for various neuroscience indications to the Allen Brain Institute or the Allen Institute for Brain Science, which was founded by Paul Allen, who unfortunately passed very recently. But the Allen Institute for Brain Science is an incredible nonprofit research institute dedicated to understanding the mysteries and decoding the mysteries of the brain. So I was working there when I got a call from my former doctoral advisor, Mike Kahana, who's now at Penn. And that was in 2014. And Mike called me up and told me that he had just gotten a $20 million contract from DARPA and was about to undertake this project for the Restoring Active Memory Project. And it was really the realization of a dream that we had, because we had always talked about, when I was doing my doctoral work, we had always talked about the possibility of using brain stimulation to improve human memory. And it was the funding from DARPA that really allowed us to do this. We put together an incredible team across the country from the Mayo Clinic to Dartmouth College to Emory University, National Institutes of Health, UT Southwestern, uh, Jefferson Hospital, University of Pennsylvania, Columbia. It was really incredible. And it was really over. And even Medtronic in Minneapolis participated in this project and helped us to develop a device that we use in our clinical studies. And it's really, you know, over, a, I'd say close to 100 people nationwide were participating in this project that allowed us to develop the technology. And it's really a testament to their effort and dedication and also to the patients who volunteered to participate in these studies. They're the real unsung heroes of this research and this technology. And it's without their contributions, it never would have happened. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. I mean, you said 200 people, 200 patients were tested. I mean, that first of all, that sounds very expensive, but to find 200 people that are willing to do this, that's much bigger than any other studies that I've heard about. Yes. And that's really one of the keys to our success in this project was having large numbers of patients, because this is a problem with many studies in general in academia is small sample size and they're unable to be reproduced. And especially when we were going into this, we weren't really sure how to do it. Right. So we had to figure it out along the way. We had to bootstrap and figure out how do we time stimulation appropriately so that it's only delivered during these poor memory states? And then which area of the brain, which brain target is really the optimal target in order to improve human memory? Those are really the two key elements to developing a successful neuromodulation therapy is timing 
of stim getting the timing right for stimulating the brain and getting the location right. And so that's what took four years is to figure out those those two big questions. And that's the rest is history. Yeah, that is actually a really good point because, you know, I've seen a lot of studies and they have, you know, rat models or something like this and, and they have four or nine or something like this. But I don't know if you could tease out an 18% difference in something like that. I mean, for example, you know, not, of course, memory for the rat, but would that have been possible with only four or nine or something? Let's say you had perfect, you know, you had already figured out the procedure and everything like this and you had that figured out already somehow. Would you be able to see that kind of difference in that kind of population? This is something we hadn't really dug into before. It turns out that traumatic brain injury is a risk factor for developing epilepsy. And neurosurgical patients that we work with are patients with epilepsy. These are the patients who volunteered for our studies. And so it turns out that just by chance, some of those 200 patients that we worked with had a history of traumatic brain injury. And so zeroing in, retrospectively, we went back, looked at these data, and we uncovered four patients with TBI who participated in our studies and who were stimulated at this part of the brain called the lateral temporal cortex that we found to be the optimal place for stimulating to improve memory. And just four subjects. And looking at those four subjects, we found the same exact 18% improvement in memory performance across those subjects. And it was close to clinically significant, which is pretty impressive that it was about like 0.08, P less than 0.08. And so that's not a bad p-value for just four subjects. And it really speaks to the power of the effect that when you see this, you do see a significant effect. It's not just a few percentage points, and it's not that some are getting it and others are getting, you know, the real concern that you have is impairing memory. And what we've seen is when you stimulate correctly at the right time, at the right location, you're not seeing memory impairment. You're seeing these increases in memory. There was one subject that didn't get the effect, but in three out of four of the patients with a history of traumatic brain injury, we did see this effect. And we're pretty excited about these new data. These are not yet published, but we're working on a manuscript to publicize these. That's really amazing. And actually, I'm curious, what's your intuition? Do you think something more than 18% is possible? Like, would we be able to do 50% or 100% at some point? I do. And like I said, we've already seen some of our patients who have 30 or 40% increases in memory performance. So I think that's where this is going to land by the time it comes to market is on that order of 30 or 40%. The theoretical limit is about 90%. That is because our technology is based not on making people exceed their normal levels of memory, but really making their bottom half of their trials or their tests look like their top half of their tests, right? And so based on that type of an analysis of variability, we really think 90% is the theoretical limit that you could get with our technology, which is huge, right? Anybody would be interested in that type of an effect. But I think the actual clinical efficacy is going to be lower than that theoretical limit. And I'm estimating and, you know, don't hold me to this or perhaps dig this up in four years once we get through our first clinical trial. But I predict we'll be up in the 30 or 40% range. <laughs> Sounds good. Dan, this is absolutely fascinating. I, I would love to sit down with you and talk about this, philosophize with you on this a little bit more, but I want to be cognizant of your time. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to mention still? No, I think we covered it. You had great questions and it's been a real pleasure to be on the podcast. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you so much. Hey guys, hopefully you enjoyed it. I really liked it. I thought that was really cool. Again, we've talked a lot about memory prosthetics, but we haven't really had anybody on the show uh, talking about it. And before we talked to Ian Opris, who kind of mentioned a memory transfer between two rats, but this is cool that they can improve this memory overall. So I'm very curious actually when this is going to come to the public and more people are going to have it where it's going to be in the public eye maybe. And so something actually that we talked about after the show that wasn't recorded is that he just closed his 
pre-seed round. So it's kind of more of an angel round of investments and not a series A or something like this. I was going to ask, but there was some drilling for the plumbers right here behind the wall where I'm recording. So, you know, I I didn't want to ask that, but yeah, excellent. Hopefully you guys enjoy this. And this is something that I would definitely watch, definitely follow these guys. And like I said, we're going to be including those three papers in the show notes. So you can click on those links and get to them there. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoy this. Hopefully learn something new and We'll talk more next time. Ciao, ciao. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.